You might be asking yourself, why does he have that ridiculous thing strapped to his face? And if you're not asking that, it's probably because you recognize this as a VR headset. And if you're something of a VR enthusiast such as myself, you might more specifically recognize it as the PSVR 2. My wife surprised me with this last Christmas. It wasn't on my wish list or anything, she just knows I love my PS5 and thought it would be a cool accessory. Even upon receiving it, I thought it was a thoughtful gift but didn't have any high expectations for it or anything. It was more of a curiosity, like, okay, I guess we'll try this out and see how it is. But let me tell you something. From the moment I strapped this on and played my first game, I was convinced that VR is the future of gaming. And the game that convinced me of that is Resident Evil Village. I actually played Resident Evil Village on a flat screen a few years ago. Great game, and I absolutely loved it. But I can't say that I was ever scared. There were definitely some intense moments, but as someone who grew up with horror movies, I felt pretty desensitized to the entire genre. But VR was a totally different experience, and there were points where I was so scared I actually had to take the headset off and remind myself that I wasn't actually in the game. I'm going to take you through some of my gameplay experiences and explain to you why this game made me a believer in VR. There will obviously be some spoilers for Resident Evil Village in this video, but I'm going to avoid major plot points that would ruin the story. There will be gameplay footage of me fighting various enemies, including some bosses. Also, I'm going to use the PSVR 2's internal microphone during the gameplay footage to give you a sense of what it sounds like. After I've taken you through the gameplay experience, in the second part of the video, I'll share my thoughts on four different headsets I've tried, the PSVR 2, Quest 2, Quest 3, and Apple Vision Pro. So really, the first point at which I was absolutely wowed by VR was at the title menu. Because even right here, I could begin to look around and see things like the incredible level of detail on the mountains, the snow-covered mountains, or the castle in the background, or this church. It's just all absolutely beautiful. And one thing about VR is that you're going to be watching this on a 2D screen and somebody watching me play the game would also watch it be projected onto a 2D screen like a television. And unfortunately that just really doesn't do justice to what the VR experience is like. I mean even just sitting right here at the title screen right now taking a few steps in you know a different direction or turning my head makes it really feel as if I'm in the game, makes it feel as if I'm really in this setting right here. Okay, let's go into the tutorial real quick, because this game does teach you how to use VR, and I think it's important to give a quick overview of that. So hold this button to reset the view, turn the right stick to look, left stick to move. By the way, the reason that when I use the right stick to move, it kind of jumps like that, is because apparently if you set it to have a fluid motion when you turn horizontally, that's the thing that's going to cause motion sickness the most. Moving like this, I guess because your eyes are still facing in the same direction the whole time, doesn't really cause motion sickness. But if, if you do this fluidly without that kind of stutter step, apparently that's, that's what really causes disorientation. By the way, I uh, do get motion sickness. Um, I get seasickness in particular on boats. But I have not experienced much in the way of motion sickness with VR. And maybe because they do this with the turning, maybe because they've kind of ironed out the kinks already. Um, you know, I was actually kind of uh, surprised by that. At least I don't get motion sickness in this game. It's not like No Man's Sky where when I couldn't get control of the ship, I was kind of just doing free spin circles like this. And yeah, this would cause me some motion sickness and I had to take the helmet off for a little bit. But once you actually chill out and start to get a sense of the controls, it's actually really freaking amazing to just be flying through outer space like this. But that's something for another video. In Resident Evil Village, I didn't really experience much in the way of motion sickness at all. And the only time I really had to take the helmet off uh, was when I was too scared to continue, which uh, I'll get into in more detail later on. So this is kind of just a demonstration of how you shoot in this game. Instead of just pressing buttons, you'll actually grab it, um, you know, eject magazine, 
reload, cock it, and it seems like a lot. Um, it's really not once you get the, a hold of it. And actually, in the actual game itself, a lot of this is is automated um, in terms of you just eject the cartridge and reload by pressing a button. But anyway, just two-handing it now. I'm closing one eye to get a better sense of the targets. That's pretty much it. And this is actually the first part that kind of freaked me out. Um, so you grab your flashlight and you head into this room and it is just pitch black and right now you're probably watching this and you're probably sitting in a room with some lighting like even when you play video games in the dark you've still kind of got the glow of the tv screen right but right now what i see is pretty much all that you see on your screen it is pitch black and i really felt like i was in a pitch black room and you know this is resident evil and i know it's just the vr tutorial but right now i'm thinking to myself oh my god is there something that's going to jump out from behind these uh these cars you know like do i have to be on guard and i really started to get a real sense of fear as if i was actually living through this as if i was actually sneaking through um you know this dim garage where a zombie could jump out at me at any given moment. And this is when I first started to really say to myself, this feels real. And it really, right from the tutorial, I got a, a stark sense of the difference between VR gaming and flat screen gaming. Now, spoiler alert here, um, nothing does jump out at you. They just want you to, I, I guess, first of all, get a sense of the fact that this is going to be a horror game. Uh, they are going to create scenes of suspense like this for you where things will actually jump out in, at you in the future. Um, but this is basically just kind of teaching you how to solve the puzzles that are, are spread throughout the game. And there we go, lights. And now uh, VR training is over. Okay, so coming up right now is one of the first major battle scenes. I'm just going to play this to kind of give you a sense of the combat. This shouldn't be a big spoiler because it's pretty early on in the game. Um, but if you don't want to watch it, you can skip ahead. So we're just going to follow this trail of blood here. I think these guys won't bother us until we get into the house. And we're going to run into the house and barricade it as quickly as possible. And I think the uh, I think the shotgun is in here. Yes, it is. Okay. There we go. Now we're in business. And so this part of the combat is basically just, I think you have to survive for a certain period of time. So this is really where kind of the survival horror element of it comes in. Oh, there we go. That's something we can use. I like the explosions in this game. Oh, perfect. That should buy us some time. So we just barricaded the door. That should buy us some time until we can trigger an explosion. Let's see if this works. Ah, oh, beautiful. That took care of a lot of them. All right, let's let's get up. Oh, shotgun shells. Beautiful. At least I think that's what this is. Yes. Ah, oh, perfect timing. Ah! Climb up. Oh, good lord. They really are all over the place here, so let's take you out if we can. Perfect. Uh... And there should be... Uh... Get off me. Oh, there's the big guy. Great. Oh my god, run! Do I have any more? No more ammo there. Oh, okay, there we go. I think that's the end of the scene. I survived long enough. The 
but now I get to the cutscene. It is a little weird in VR sometimes when you're kind of like standing up <laughs> and they're playing these cutscenes where you're on the ground getting thrown around like a rag doll. Oh man. Jumps away like the Incredible Hulk. And just like that, I'm spared. Pretty adrenaline-inducing intro. I used to be a Resident Evil adventurer until I took an arrow to the knee. So one thing I want to comment on is the difference in the sense of scale that you get in VR. You might have sensed it a little bit when you saw that scene where that giant monster was getting like right in my face and on a flat screen I think it just really doesn't convey uh, how big that guy is supposed to be but when you're in VR and you're like really seeing from the perspective of your own two eyes uh, him towering over you it really does uh, you really get the sense of how giant he is Perhaps the best example of the sense of scale is everyone's favorite big blue bad mama jamma here, Lady Dimitrescu. Now, if you're familiar with this game, you may know Lady Dimitrescu because she's been the source of many memes due to her bountiful bosom, and she's appeared in a lot of the packaging and ads for the game. She's supposed to be a giant, but I have to be honest, I didn't really get a sense of her size until I played VR. I, I don't even really remember her being a giant when I played it on flat screen, to be perfectly honest with you. But in this game, it just definitely feels like she's towering over you. And when she's chasing you, it really is just completely terrifying because her the sheer size of her just takes up so much space that it's hard to see around her when you're uh, you know trying to dodge her and trying to find some sort of escape route. All right, just to give you a sense of that right now, I'm going to be brave and leave the safety of this save room and run right up to her and run! Oh, sh... All right, so as you can see, that was not pleasant. Not pleasant at all. Oh, my goodness. And now we're going to try to... Take the back door route to get back into the safe room. Ah, oh, since I got the uh, clip that I need now. You know, something else I just really want to mention. I've played through this game twice now. Shut up, Duke. Um, I've played through this game twice now. And uh, the first time when I played it through in flat screen, as I've mentioned before, I didn't really feel, oh geez, I didn't really feel all that terrified. Um, when I played it in VR the first time, I felt really terrified, but I, I didn't expect to feel this kind of intensity going through the game the second time, um, you know, because I was... I only played this game over the last like month and I'm already familiar with all the jump scares and stuff. And despite that, it's just really freaking intense. Um, in case you're wondering, by the way, for whatever reason, she doesn't come into this room. She doesn't attack you in this room. It's probably because of this guy, the Duke, who's a merchant, who's got some sort of like, I guess some sort of unexplained type of powers or something. But anyway, we're safe here. This is our safe space. So one thing I kind of want to talk about too is the difference in combat between flat screen and VR is that in VR the combat is so much more claustrophobic. Um, you kind of saw that with the last combat clip I showed you, but really, I mean, when you're playing on a flat screen, you know, there's 
uh, all sorts of other objects that might be between you and the screen. There's all sorts of distance that might be between you and the screen. But in VR, it's like right up in front of your face. I mean, yeah, this guy's like really up close and personal right now. Let's see if I can get a shot right in his face. All right, so let's put this thing down here. There we go. So one thing that is kind of weird that you may have noticed is kind of how your arm is kind of disembodied like this. You know, it is kind of strange right now, like I'm opening this door and right here it looks fine. You know, it looks like it's attached to my body, but when I pull it out, it's just kind of like all the way over there. It's kind of strange, but you get used to it. They've got some ways to go, I guess, in terms of kind of rendering a full player body. So the other thing I want to mention about VR is that it is more physically strenuous than uh, playing something on a flat screen. Because obviously when you play a flat screen, you are sitting on the comfort of your couch and basically just inputting buttons. Um, you know, in VR, it's not like most of the time you're not, you know, actually running around uh, or anything like that. But you can stand if you want to. Standing is probably a better experience. And you can also sit if you want to, um, which sometimes will be more comfortable. But it still does require you to at least kind of, you know, move your hands, move your head. And it gives you a bit more physical exertion than a regular game would. So I think that's pretty much it in terms of covering the gameplay of Resident Evil Village and trying to point out some of the major differences I noticed between playing it in VR and playing it on flat screen. Um, as I said at the beginning of the video, I don't want this to be something that uh, is a spoiler for the game or anything in the way of a walkthrough of the game. I really just wanted to give you a sense of how I felt playing it and you know why it really kind of convinced me that VR is the future of gaming. Now, when I say that, and I'll get into this a bit more in uh, the next chapter for this video, I understand that there are still challenges that are facing VR. Um, I understand that it is still relatively a niche genre. But after playing in VR for a few months now, I still feel pretty strongly that this is where gaming and multimedia in general has to go because there's only so much you can do with a flat screen. I mean, you know, going from old analog TVs to, you know, 1080p to 4K to um, whatever, at some point, you know, there needs to be a jump in the technology to take you to um, a new evolutionary design in the process. And I really think that this is it. And I'm really encouraged now by the fact that, you know, companies like Meta and Apple are uh, starting to compete with each other a bit for this space. I think that that's really good. I think that it'll probably still take um, some time for this to become mainstream. They've got to do things like make the headsets more, uh, you know, easier to wear, make them more accessible so that people can actually try them because seeing is believing with VR. But I honestly feel that in, in some amount of time, whether it be, you know, years from now or even decades from now, I think we're going to look back on, uh, on flat screen gaming as something that's kind of primitive. So after playing Resident Evil Village, I was so impressed by VR gaming that I had to go out and try a few other headsets. Again, those of you who are discerning VR enthusiasts may have noticed already that I've switched to wearing a Quest 2. The reason I switched to my Quest 2 is because I can link it directly to my PC and read my notes off of a Word document that's appearing right in front of me on the headset here, but that you can't see. I can't do that with my PSVR 2, unfortunately. Now, Sony has announced that they're working on some sort of PC compatibility, but as of the date of this video, we're still waiting for them to give more specific details about what exactly that entails. For now, Quest systems have the advantage over PSVR 2 of both being a standalone system and having PC VR functionality. I did get a chance to try my cousin's Quest 3 and was told that the pancake lenses would make a dramatic difference in terms of the visuals, but I honestly didn't notice it much in the short period of time I had to play it. However, one thing I did notice on the Quest 3 was the difference in the pass-through camera. Specifically that the pass-through is in color, as opposed to the black and white pass-through of the Quest 2 and PSVR 2. Even wearing this Quest 2 right now, 
I can read off my Word document because the headset is connected to the PC and my PC desktop is portrayed in color. But if I was just using the regular black and white pass-through camera, I wouldn't be able to read this piece of paper that's being held right directly in front of me. And the same thing goes for the PSVR2. In terms of pass-through technology, the best headset that I've tried so far is the Apple Vision Pro. Again, this isn't a headset that I got to try for a long time. I only did the tech demo at the Apple Store. But even in that short amount of time, I really felt that the pass-through was superior. The VR videos were also incredible. They had a short demo with Alicia Keys where it really felt like she was in the room singing directly in front of you. I was also really impressed by the eye tracking and lack of use of controllers on the Apple Vision Pro. When I first put the headset on, I was kind of skeptical about how you would be able to actually open the app icons by just looking at them with your eyes and pinching like this. But it actually worked with like a surprising amount of accuracy and I was really impressed by that. However, as far as gaming is concerned, well, let's just say $3,500 and you can't even play Beat Saber on that thing. Also, I don't really use the Apple ecosystem, but even if I did, I couldn't justify that price tag. You could get a Quest 3 for everyone in a family of five for the same amount of money. Circling back to the PSVR 2, like I said, it definitely has some of its own limitations. Um, as I mentioned, there's currently no PC VR compatibility, although that might change as early as this year. The other thing is that it can only be used with the accompanying wire, so that can really limit your mobility. Um, you can't switch this wire out, so you're limited to the range that it has, and you can't uh, operate it wirelessly like you can a Quest headset. Perhaps the biggest hang-up I have with the PSVR 2 is the limited game library. It's unfortunately true across the industry that VR libraries are limited. Indie devs carry the bulk of the load, and AAA companies are very hesitant to get in, with Ubisoft being the latest to throw in the towel after only just releasing their Assassin's Creed VR game. However, this is even more pronounced on the PSVR 2, where there's no backwards compatibility like there is with, say, a Quest 3 or on PC VR. That means you're losing access to a ton of PSVR 1 games. However, there's still a lot of upside to the PSVR 2. For me, it's the best gaming headset so far. I love the design of it. There's a bunch of different options for you to adjust it. Like you can move the front in and out, and you can also adjust the back in and out with this button here. And then there's also um, this dial here that lets you adjust the focus. So there's just a lot of different options um, to adjust the headset and make it fit comfortably for you. Uh, the head strap that comes with the Quest is just straight up garbage. And apparently the official Elite strap that Meta sells also breaks easily. I bought a Kiwi um, head uh, strap, which is highly recommended and I love it, but it still doesn't have as many adjustment options as the PSVR 2. I do also think that PSVR 2 games look better than Quest games. Now, I know a lot of people are going to compare things like OLED on the PSVR 2 or pancake lenses on the Quest 3, but I'm not talking about that. I just mean that the games you can download directly onto the Quest don't measure up to those on the PSVR 2. By way of example, the version of Resident Evil 4 on the Quest is a port of the GameCube version, while the PSVR 2 version is the more recent remake. You're talking about an 8 gigabit game versus a 58 gigabyte game that, so the difference is going to be palpable. That is, of course, because the PSVR 2 has to be plugged into the PS5, and it's the PS5 that stores all that data and has all that processing power. The Quest by itself can't compare with that, not unless, of course, you pair it with a uh, PC VR, which hopefully the PSVR 2 will also be able to do eventually. But even with PC VR, you're probably looking at a $1,500 PC minimum to run an experience comparable to the PSVR 2, at least according to the specs given to me by my cousin, who's a member of the PC Master Race. Uh, and when you take that into consideration, the combined cost of the PSVR 2 and the PS5 doesn't seem all that outrageous. Now, I'm not trying to get into the VR version of console wars here. Admittedly, I am a console peasant, and the PlayStation is my system of choice. But I don't have any sort of misguided loyalty to Sony. I think I've been rather fair in my assessments, and the end result is that I would absolutely recommend the PSVR 2 if you already own the PS5. 
especially if Sony makes an official announcement for PC VR support, because that would give you the best of both worlds. So that kind of wraps it up for this video about how I got into VR, and I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope that it helped to convey my enthusiasm for this. I'm still relatively new to VR, but I'm really excited about the possibility of this technology, and I'm planning to delve into it further. So if you enjoyed this video, please hit like, and also hit subscribe, because I am planning to do some more videos uh, where I delve deeper into VR and I try to document my experience with it. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you again soon in the not too distant future. Take care.